Dr. VJ Rao has been a cardiologist with Fran Franciscan Physician Network Indiana Heart Physicians since 2011. He is from Carmel, Indiana and received his undergraduate degree in biology from DePaul University. He graduated from the Medical University of South Carolina and completed his residency in internal medicine at Duke University Medical Center. His fellowship was completed at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Rao also has a PhD in molecular and cellular biology and pathobiology from the Medical University of South Carolina. He is board certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular disease, echocardiography, nuclear cardiology, and heart failure. He has a special interest in heart failure, cardio-oncology, and heart valve disease. Welcome, Dr. Rao. Thank you, Don, for that kind introduction. And thank you all for uh, taking an hour out of your evening. Um, really appreciate that. And I appreciate the invitation uh, to speak to you all. Um, the topic today is really um, a passion of mine. Uh, and I think what we really um, wanna kind of focus on today is um, really a, a burden of disease that we see so commonly, uh, heart failure. Uh, there have been tremendous advancements in this space. Uh, and what we're really gonna focus on today is uh, one aspect of heart failure, that's heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, the old diastolic heart failure. Um, I know uh, it's a fairly large topic, so I'm gonna cover quite a bit of ground. So bear with me. And uh, most of the topics um, regarding systolic heart failure will be covered by Dr. Britson on a future grand rounds. So with that, those are my disclosures that Don has already mentioned to you. So let's talk about heart failure. Um, leading discharge diagnosis in the Western world, we know that 6 million in the United States over the age of 20 uh, expected to increase in prevalence by 46% between 2012 and 2030. Uh, we know that these patients uh, consume a fair amount of our healthcare resources. 80% are hospitalized at least once. 43% are hospitalized at least four times after a diagnosis. So um, you can see that uh, once a patient gets hospitalized, it's this spiral that occurs um, that really uh, is, you know, should heighten our attention to taking care of these patients. Mortality remains high after hospitalization. Uh, again, that hospitalization being a seminal event, 30-day mortality is 10%, one-year mortality, 22%, and the five-year mortality is 42%. Uh, you can see there the cost $31 billion to the healthcare system in 2012, which is expected to increase to over $70 billion by 2030. And as I mentioned early, 80% of that cost is really due to hospitalizations, which is one of the main reasons that CMS has really implemented um, the readmission penalty to try to focus on trying to keep patients out of the hospital. So how do we define heart failure? It, it's funny because we all learn about signs and symptoms of heart failure, but you know it's a difficult diagnosis to make often. And it wasn't really until 2021 that the Heart Failure Society of America, the European Society of Cardiology, and the Japanese Heart Failure Society came up with this sort of standardized universal definition. And what it is, it's heart failure is a clinical syndrome with current or prior symptoms and or signs caused by structural and or functional cardiac abnormality and corroborated by at least one of the following, elevated natriuretic peptide levels or objective evidence of cardiogenic pulmonary or systemic congestion. So you can see it really, it's not just a signs and symptoms piece, you really need to have that natriuretic peptide or you know, x-ray or physical exam findings consistent with fluid overload. So how do we break down heart failure? Um, this is kind of a busy slide, but on the left you can see there's the definition signs and symptoms. In the middle, you can see the stages of heart failure. And the Heart Failure Society of America came up with this because we really had in the past had focused on New York heart functional class. And as we know, patients can be functional class four, one day and three days later, functional class one. And what we're tr they were trying to do is standardize such that therapies that are used for one population continue on. So they really broke it down into four stages. You can see there's stage A, who are patients at risk for heart failure. So those are patients uh, who might be getting, um, you know, a particularly toxic chemotherapy, for example, uh, patients who are hypertensive who are at risk. You have stage B or pre-heart failure. So those are patients without any signs or symptoms of heart failure, but actually have structural heart disease, meaning they have 
left ventricular hypertrophy or left atrial enlargement, potentially even a redu reduction in their ejection fraction, uh, but still don't have symptoms. And then they eventually do develop the signs and symptoms of heart failure, and then we classify them as stage C. And then finally, stage D, which are those advanced heart failure patients who are uh, refractory to our best therapies, the guideline-directed medical therapy, who we really need to start thinking about, you know, uh, palliative care or sending to for transplantation or mechanical circulatory support. Now, on the far right side there, you can see that we also classify heart failure by ejection fraction. And, you know, this got a little bit more complicated of late. So the most recent way to look at this, an ejection fraction you all know is the amount of blood that's ejected out of the left ventricle with each, each beat, um, is kind of broken down now into four categories. And the four categories are heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, or otherwise known as HEF-REF. That's with an EF of less than 40%. We have heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction, which is 41 to 49%. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, that's that HEF-PEF that I mentioned in the title today, with uh, over 50%. And then there's actually uh, uh, another category called heart failure with improved ejection fraction. So those are patients who initially had a significant reduction in heart function and then subsequently have improvement back either into the normal or slightly reduced uh, level. So this is kind of how we're looking at uh, heart failure now in these sort of four categories. But what we're really gonna focus on today is again, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And at this point in the current day and age, they're kind of grouped these two categories are grouped together. So it's basically anybody with an ejection fraction greater than 40% with heart failure is who we're really talking about today. And this was a study, uh, you know, a figure that, um, that came out uh, from Lamb's group looking at a proposed nomenclature in heart failure. And you can see there, there's that heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction, heart failure with um, you know, preserved ejection fraction. There were normal EF. And they're combined to what we call the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And the other reason I point out this slide is that what is a normal ejection fraction is actually a little bit different based on gender. So you can see that for women, a normal ejection fraction is 60%, but in men, it's slightly lower at 55%. So, um, but all of these, what we're gonna be talking about today is anything greater than 40% for, for the purposes of the so what about this heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? You know, how, how many patients have this and what is the trends uh, that we see? So this was a paper in current heart failure uh, review that looked at the proportion of hospitalized heart failure patients based on, on their ejection fraction. And what they did was from 2005 to 2010 on the left side of the screen here, in red, you can see those are the reduced ejection fraction patients and they're, they're prevalence was decreasing. And in the blue dots there, you can see that was the HEFPEF population. And in the bottom there, that's the heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction. So what you can see, and they extrapolated it out all the way to 2020, and you can see that the curves continue to diverge such that really what you're seeing is the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and mid-range is about 65% as of 2020. And I can tell you, having tracked this data quite closely at Franciscan, this is exactly what we see. About two thirds of our patients who are being admitted to the hospital at Franciscan have heart failure with, with, with a diagnosis of heart failure, have preserved EF as opposed to the reduced EF. So this prevalence is increasing dramatically. And so we really need to think about how we're gonna identify these patients and take the best care of, for, of, for them. So what about outcomes? Um, you know, we used to think, well, if you had a reduced ejection fraction, those are the patients that we're talking about defibrillators and you know, very shortened life expectancy. You know, if they've got preserved ejection fraction, well, sure, they they have a little bit of fluid overload. They're probably going to do a lot better. And this is a bit of an old slide from 2006 in a New England Journal paper. But this looks at the Kaplan-Meier looking at survival between preserved and reduced ejection fraction. And what you can see is that there's they're superimposable. There's very little difference between the two groups. And in fact, if you fast forward to 2022, this is still the case that the outcomes are similar between the two groups. And on the left there, you can see the five-year survival after a heart failure hospitalization is only 30 to 35%. And what's important to recognize is that, you know, when we think about cancer, for example, advanced lung cancer, 
that's actually the similar mortality rate for advanced lung cancer. So really heightens um, our awareness that we, we need to do better for these patients. We need to identify this condition and we need to do everything in our power to try to stem uh, this, this spiral of, of poor outcomes. So this was an interesting study looking at actual mortality of the different groups. So on the left, you have the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And then um, in the center on the right are what we would really term our HEFPEF patients. Um, and it, the pink is cardiac mortality and all of the blue are the other comorbidities. So there's cancer, respiratory disease, sepsis, renal disease, and other causes. And it's pretty clear to see from this slide that in reduced ejection fraction patients, the vast majority of, of the mortality is cardiac. But you can see as the ejection fraction improves, it's a lot less cardiac, so, such that in the HEF-PEF population, 38% um, only are cardiac mortality. The rest are non-cardiac mortality. So it really drives home the point that comorbidities really play a much larger role in the HEF-PEF population than in the HEF-REF population. So this is a slide um, that's a figure that's actually coming from a paper that um, we have put together that's been submitted to the Journal of Hospital Medicine. But I like it because it really kind of compares these two groups. And on the left is the HEFREF population. The etiology you can see is usually myocardial ischemia or coronary disease. It affects males and females pretty equally, but they have a lower frequency of comorbidities. The cardiac features there's a low LV mass to volume ratio. Um, they have diminished contractility, as you can imagine, with the reduced ejection fraction. Now, on the right side, and you typically see this is the HEFPEF population, much more commonly seen in an older aging population with metabolic and renal dysfunction, neuroendocrine abnormalities, much more common in females than males, uh, and again, have much higher rates of heart failure hospitalization. Now, their cardiac features are quite different. They are the ones that have these smaller ventricles who are much thicker, so they have concentric LV remodeling, um, and they have what we term systolic pressure overload. Many of these patients have hypertension that drives a lot of this. And on the bottom there, you can see the signs and symptoms of heart failure, which you're all quite familiar with, the orthopnea, PMD. Don't forget about reduced exercise tolerance, ankle swelling, dyspnea on exertion, and then the physical exam findings of elevated neck veins, a third heart sound, pulmonary rolls, fatigue, and, and also confusion in the elderly patient. So really kind of highlighting some of the differences between these two populations. Now, this is another way of looking at that. Now, let's specifically focus on HEFPATH. What are the comorbidities? And, you know, we can never forget about ischemia. Uh, ischemia can drive both reduced ejection fraction as well as preserved ejection fraction. Uh, you see diabetes, anemia, obesity, and we'll get back to this later, but obesity is one of the largest driving factors for this HEFPEF population. Uh, and lots of interesting studies have been done in that, in that uh, space. Aging and deconditioning, renal dysfunction I mentioned earlier, there's hypertension, a very high prevalence of atrial fibrillation, along with chronic lung disease. So what does that lead to then? The, what's the pathophysiology? And really systemic inflammation, which leads to oxidative stress and endothelial dysfunction drives a lot of this. So there in the middle, you can see that there's LV diastolic dysfunction. And I also point out left atrial dysfunction. So there's, it's an atrial myopathy. Um, there's chronotropic incompetence. So that means when patients are exercising, their heart rates don't uh, increase appropriately, leading to fatigue and dyspnea. They often have microvascular dysfunction, which is as opposed to what we typically think of with epicardial coronary disease. They can have uh, deficits in, in their um, actual myocardial metabolism, um, and they can develop RV dysfunction from pulmonary hypertension, and often have skeletal mu muscle dysfunction as well. So on the bottom there, you can see that's that there, there are various phenotypes. Now, ultimately what happens is you have an elevation in, in LV filling pressures, that lead to volume overload. And it's interesting, there's, there's the coronary artery disease in the bottom right with HEFPEF. There's an atrial fibrillation with HEFPEF. You have a, a pulmonary hypertension, right heart failure patient predominant HEFPEF. There's a valvular high output 
And we're still learning about the various phenotypes. It turns out, you know, many of our negative studies in this population are likely because there's such a distinct heterogeneity in terms of phenotype that one size may not fit all. And we really need to think about these individual populations and study the individual populations for some of our therapeutic maneuvers. So echocardiography is, is really one of the hallmarks for diagnosis. Uh, you can see here on the left, um, that's a normal uh, ventricle, left ventricle. Uh, and then on the right, you can see it, you can see that that's a thickened, smaller ventricle um, with a larger left atrium. And what happens again in, in this HEFPEF phenotype is that there's an increase in inflammation that leads to endothelial dysfunction. Um, there's an increase in nit uh, a decrease in nitric oxide. And ultimately, what happens are fibroblasts get activated, which then lead to collagen deposition and fibrosis throughout the muscle. And collagen, you know, you can think about it as like steel cables. The more collagen gets deposited, the less distensible the, the heart muscle and myocardium becomes. And that's part of the pathophysiology of, of this phenotype. So in terms of echocardiography, you'll probably be quite common, uh, commonly ordering echoes to try to better, transthoracic echoes to better understand somebody's, you know, first, do they have HEFREF or do they have HEFPEF? And one of the things that we do on echo, and you'll see this in the reports, is a measure of diastolic function. And on the top there, that's looking at LV volumes. And I won't get into the weeds too much here, but just to let you know that there's a rapid, um, you know, up to systole, you know, you can imagine that as the ventricle's pumping, the LV volume, it goes down because it's being ejected out of the ventricle. Then in diastole, there is a rapid filling that occurs that at the bottom, you can see results in what's called an E wave. That's early diastolic filling. Then there's what's called diastasis, where the line basically becomes flat. And then lastly, the atrium kicks in and preserve, gives you this little extra bit of blood flow uh, in diastole, and that's called the A wave. So in diastole, you have, um, which is very easily seen on echocardiography, you have this E wave and an A wave. So how do we use that? Uh, and I, again, not going to get into too many details here because this is really a course unto itself in terms of measuring diastolic function on echo for cardiologists. But I will say that there's gradation. So you can see in the middle there, um, there's a grade one or mild diastolic dysfunction. And as you move to the right, the filling pressures increase and that we can grade that as moderate diastolic dysfunction or severe or restrictive um, diastolic function or grade three or four. So be looking for that on your echo reports, particularly in the hef when you're, you're considering HEFPEF in a patient when they're short of breath or volume overloaded, and you want to know, you really um, want to look for that to see if they have either grade two or grade three um, diastolic function on their echo. And this is just an algorithm that we often use um, to diagnose diastolic dysfunction. Um, and there's multiple uh, aspects to this, but you know, using a combination of these factors, you can kind of come up with a diagnosis. Um, I will just point out in the blue box there that you know, a couple of important components are pulmonary hypertension. So you know, often in a, in a heart failure, um, HEFPEF population, there's pulmonary hypertension. So you have to kind of question the diagnosis that the patient doesn't have pulmonary hypertension. And this is typically pulmonary venous hypertension from elevated left-sided filling pressures. And the last one there, number four, you can see is a left atrial volume index. So as you can imagine, if there's high filling pressures in the ventricle that transmits into high filling pressures in the left atrium, you all remember from medical school days, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which is the uh, surrogate for that left atrial pressure, it should be elevated in heart failure. And when it's elevated, what happens? The left atrial wall is thin and it stretches and the volume increases in that left atrium. So another really important clinical pearl is if you see an echocardiogram with a normal left atrial size, you can still have that with heart failure, but it's all, it's rare. So you should question the diagnosis if, of, of heart failure in general with a normal left atrial size. So how else can we, you know, I mentioned earlier the, the, um, the diagnosis and the definition of heart failure, and it did mention Naturetic peptides. So this was one of the classic studies done by Alan Maisel at UCSD, which was published, what, 20 years ago now in the New England Journal of Medicine, looking at uh, BNP, so brain naturetic peptide. 
and we all are quite familiar with this uh, hormone that's produced by the body in response to increased filling pressure. And they did a really nice study to look at, you know, optimal cut points, looking at an AUC curve here, looking at sensitivities and specificities. And what they found was really the optimal cut point for BNP is 100, and 100 picograms per mil. And, and why is that? Because the sensitivity at that point is 90%, and the specificity is 76% for the diagnosis of And it's really particularly useful if it's lower than 100, you can effectively rule out um, heart failure with a few um, exceptions, which we'll get into in a little bit. So to summarize, uh, BNP, now I only, I, I show you BNP, there's also another assay, the N-terminal pro-BNP, we do not have this at Franciscan, but if you go to any of the outreach hospitals, uh, like we do go to quite a few, they will use that assay. Very similar uh, data with respect to both in terms of increases with respect to filling pressures, with respect to making the diagnosis of heart failure, as well as prognosis. Now, I will mention my first bullet there is that N, the BNP or natriuretic levels are often lower in HEFPEF than they are in HEFREF. So important to recognize that. Second, you this is another really important clinical point with our population of obesity, who particularly, as I mentioned earlier, have HEFPEF. You can have a false negative BNP when the BMI is greater than 35. And up to 20% of those patients could be in florid heart failure, but have a normal BNP. Now, why is that? No one really knows, but a couple of uh, theories. One is that there's less production of BNP um, in, the, in the obese population, and that could partly be related to why there's elevated levels of um, blood pressure, for example, in that population. Secondly, um, adipocytes, which are in much higher abundance in an obese population, are actually very, um, they, have, they have clearance receptors for BNP. So if there's more of the clearance receptors, you might not get the levels that you would normally see in the, in the bloodstream. But these are really hypotheses. And, and there's been one suggestion um, that if you have a patient with a BMI greater than 35, that you might want to use a BMP cutoff, um, you know, a little bit different uh, than, than otherwise. But I think the key point here is at the bottom is the BNP less than 100 for rule out. If it's greater than 300, it's very good for ruling in heart failure. So this is another uh, really, you know, the group is probably familiar with the CHADS, VAS score, these acronyms that help us score and make uh, decisions about, you know, you've heard about the HASBLED score, for example, for bleeding with, um, with anticoagulants and, and CHADS, VAS for figuring out stroke. Well, the HEF2 PEF score has actually been well validated to help make the diagnosis of HEF. And you can see here, um, heavy. The H2, H2 stands for heavy and hypertensive. So a body mass index greater than 30 kilograms per meter squared, you get two points. If the patient's hypertensive on two or more medicines, you get one point. F stands for atrial fibrillation. So if they have paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation, they actually get three points. P stands for pulmonary hypertension. So that's a PA pressure or right ventricular systolic pressure greater than 35 on echo. They get a point. I mentioned to you earlier, age plays a large role. So if you're over the age of 60, you get a point. And then filling pressures based on an echocardiographic uh, parameter, which is something called the EE prime, you get one point. And when you add them all together, you can see on the bottom there, the total points, the probability of heart failure. So if you have five or more points based on this HEF2 PEF score, there's a greater than 80% probability that your patient has HEF PEF. And if you have six, it's actually greater than 90%. So it's a really useful scoring system um, to kind of help you figure out if this patient has heart failure. Now, one of the common symptoms, obviously, is dyspnea. Uh, and, and this is something that uh, we are commonly faced with the patient who's short of breath, and we're trying to figure out what's the etiology. And this was just kind of an interesting, um, you know, top diagnostic uh, sort of um, study that looked retrospectively at when a, where a patient presented and what the most common diagnoses were for shortness of breath. On the left is something called a rescue service. Um, so that's when, you know, first coming out to see the patient, uh, urgent cares, things like that. Heart failure, 15 to 16%, pneumonia, 10 to 18%, and COPD were the big three. Now, emergency room visits, COPD, heart failure, and pneumonia being the top three. And 
you know, that's the trifecta, right? Somebody comes in with shortness of breath, they're placed on antibiotics, they're given Lasix, and they're placed on steroids or inhalers. And, you know, kind of that's very commonly what we see coming out of the ER, because frankly, at that point, it's often very difficult to make the diagnosis. Their x-ray, you know, could look wet, it could have infiltrates, um, their patient's short of breath and coughing and wheezing. So, you know, for all intents and purposes, the patient gets treated for all three of these. And then as the, you know, days progress, we start to figure out it's one or the other. Um, but when you look at general practice in the outpatient setting, the top four there are respiratory, right? Acute bronchitis, acute upper respiratory tract infections, other airway infections, bronchial asthma, COPD, and look at heart failure way down at the bottom. So, you know, we can't forget about it in general practice, but typically when somebody's getting sick enough to end up in an emergency room setting, that's when the heart failure piece really starts. Now, I just really like this. I thought this was, um, you know, a nice way when we're thinking about dyspnea to think about what are the different, what's in your differential diagnosis? And you all, you know, know this, but it's nice to kind of have a, a quick review. There's sort of the cardiovascular side of things. So myocardium, you can see heart failure, coronary disease, valvulopathy. There's arrhythmia, so somebody could have an SVT or AFib, for example, or bradycardic, and then pericardial issues. You can see on the left, there's a large differential for pulmonary with airways, vascular, parenchymal disease, alveolar disease, and pleural disease. Um, and you can see on the bottom there, there's things like chest wall, neuromuscular, and you, you know, definitely don't forget about anemia. But you know, this is a pretty good broad differential for someone who comes to you with short. Now, it's very, so how do we make a definitive diagnosis of, of heart failure? You know, I mentioned echocardiography. That's definitely a, a good starting point. Patients are often treated, you know, with Lasix. And the, really the gold standard when you're trying to figure out, does somebody have HEFPEF? It's a right heart catheterization. And this is some really seminal work that was done by Barry Borlaug uh, that was published in Circulation in 2010. And this was a cath lab study. So, uh, you know, right heart cath. So if you look on the upper left there, these are the pulmonary capillary wedge pressures. So as I mentioned, this is a surrogate for what's going on on the left, left atrial pressure as the left ventricular pressure. And, it, you know, at baseline normal. Now, just doing a simple maneuver where you put the patient's feet up in the cath lab, you increase venous return, and on the bottom there, that's a normal patient. That's like you, you know, a patient without heart failure. You can see there's not much change in the filling pressure. But look what happens to the half pep patient on the top there when you just put the feet up. It, the, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure nearly doubles from 10 to 20. Now, in the cath lab, you can have a patient do hand crank exercises. You can have them actually bicycle while they're doing the right heart cath. And if you or I were to do that, you can see at the bottom, there really isn't a significant increase in wedge pressure. We're able to accommodate that with exercise. But look what happens with the HEFPEF patient. Stiff ventricle, stiff atrium, they're not able to manage that extra fluid that's occurring and the extra metabolic demand, and you get a dramatic rise in, in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And on the left-hand side, you can see this is the same thing, rest and exercise on a normal patient, Rest and exercise in terms of left ventricular end diastolic pressure and even their mean PA pressure. So, this is really when you're all, at all in doubt, you really need to think about a right heart catheterization. And one of the other points of this is, you know, very important when you, when you refer a patient for a right heart cath and you're concerned about PEFPEF, you need to provoke the system. So, so many of these patients, if you just do the right heart cath and their wedge pressure is normal, and everybody's happy, hey, the patient doesn't have heart failure, their they're resting wedge pressure is normal, you will miss up to 20% of patients with HEFPAP. The patient either needs to exercise or you need to give them a fluid challenge, an IV fluid bolus of, for example, 500 cc's of normal saline over about five minutes. It's a rapid uh, push of fluids. Again, the normal patient will accommodate that that without heart failure, the patient with HEFPEF will have a dramatic rise in, in their filling pressure. Uh, and then exercise. So very important for, for the diagnosis. Now, I just want to give you a, a little bit. We've talked a lot about the, um, the horses, but, you know, occasionally there are some zebras out there, and we I want you to be aware of this one. So 
there's a, a protein called transthyretin, which is a retinal binding protein produced in the liver. And when it's mutated, uh, which is what we call senile or wild type, um, which is an elderly population, or a patient can have a hereditary form of this, this tetramer, this transthyretin, actually dissociates into monomers. And then that mo those monomers start to crosslink and form something called amyloid. And the amyloid can deposit in the heart, and it is the prototypical HEFPEF syndrome because we talked about collagen, as I showed you earlier, that gets deposited from fibroblasts. This is about 100 times more stiff than collagen when you look at amyloid. And so when that deposits, these patients can develop really significant heart failure. So why do I mention it? Well, several recent studies have actually identified the prevalence of TTR amyloid to be as high as 10 to 15% of elderly patients. So those are patients over the age of 60 with a diagnosis of HEFPEF and a thickened LV wall. 10 to 15% of those patients were actually later found to have TTR amyloidosis. Now, why do we care? Because there's actually a treatment for it. And if we don't make that diagnosis, the outcome is, is far worse than the actual HEFPEF population that I mentioned to you earlier. The mortality is much higher than 50% at five years. And there is a treatment called Defamidus uh, that is approved for this condition. Now, you know, it's a very expensive medication uh, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, ethics that we're trying to figure out ways to, to reduce costs. But nevertheless, I want you to be aware of that, that particular condition. So who would you suspect of, of this amyloidosis? Uh, what are some of the red flags? One of them is the left ventricular wall thickness that's increased. But when you look at their EKG, you would expect to see high volts, but you don't, you see low voltage. So a discordance between a thick ventricle and the EKG, which shows low voltage, a high suspicion for amyloidosis. These patients are very intolerant to beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. So you have somebody who gets hypotensive and just really doesn't tolerate these medications, think about amyloid. Um, low normal blood pressure in a patient who's previously been hypertensive. And a big one is bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. And this amyloid deposits in the, the sheath, the, the tendon sheath. And patients often will have bilateral uh, carpal tunnel surgery. Um, and some of the actual studies, interestingly enough, sent off that tissue and found a very high prevalence of amyloid in, in patients who've been referred for carpal tunnel surgery. And on the bottom right, you can see that there's, these are a couple of others. You have a male over the age of 60 with a diagnosis of HEFPEF with carpal tunnel syndrome and spinal stenosis is another one. You have African-Americans over the age of 60 with a diagnosis of HEFPEF, but who don't have a history of hypertension. So you have this LV thickness without hypertension. Well, how did that happen? A new diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in an elderly patient. It's very seldom we, we make that diagnosis in an elderly patient. It's usually presenting much earlier. So think about amyloid. Uh, low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis, also a higher prevalence of TTR amyloid in that population. So just a couple of things for you, some clinical pearls for you to kind of be thinking about uh, when you start to see some of these patients. So on the left here, you can see, um, you know, HFREF. We had tons of therapies. Um, and this is just, you can see RNAs, MRAs, beta blockers, ACEs and ARBs, ivabradine, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, you know, a, a lot of therapies with proven benefit to improve morbidity and mortality. And this is a bit of an old slide, but if you look on the right, this is how all HEFPEF study uh, talks, you know, were, were. They would show you there are no therapeutics available for HEFPEF. Sorry, um, you know, similar outcome. Uh, we have no treatments, so good luck. Uh, fortunately, it's 2022, and there's been an explosion of research in this area, and a lot of exciting new developments and therapies, which I'm going to take you through now. So this is, uh, at the top there, you can see the three main categories that really have kind of jumped onto the landscape here in this population. One are neprilysin inhibitors, uh, angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors, that's ARNI, otherwise known as secubitril valsartan. Mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, you all know that as spironolactone or aldactone, and SGLT2 inhibitors. And why do we think they might help in patients with HEFPA? Well, these therapies, you know, uh, have an impact on um, inflammation. Uh, they have an impact on sodium retention and, and volume expansion. They have an impact on uh, cardiac metabolics, all of which are, you know, have gone awry in HEFPA. So there's a lot of 
theory to support the mechanism that can potentially help. So let's start off with one of the largest trials um, that was in New published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2019. This was the Paragon HF study. So you all are familiar with uh, the cubitrovalsartan for hef ref. So this was a study in the hef pef population. And you can see the question was, in patients with hef pef, here they used an ejection fraction greater than or equal to 45%. Will Secubitril valsartan or ARNI result in a decrease in CV mortality and heart failure hospitalization compared to valsartan, which is an ARB, alone? And you can see there were 4,822 patients. Half of the patients got the ARNI, half of them got valsartan and the primary outcome there. Now, what was interesting, this study did not meet its primary endpoint. The relative risk reduction was 0.87. So there was a 13% relative risk re reduction in the primary outcome. But you can see the p-value there of 0.06. It, it, it came very close, but did not meet statistical significance. And you can see on the secondary outcomes there, all-cause mortality really wasn't different between the two groups. However, interestingly, they did have a secondary outcome looking at progression to end-stage renal disease, renal failure, or worsening GFR, and that was uh, very um, positive in the sense that it was a 50% reduction in that outcome. But nevertheless, only hypothesis generating because the primary outcome, again, didn't meet statistical significance. And these were patients with New York Heart Functional Class 2 to 4 uh, with elevated natriuretic peptides. Also, those are the ones who got into the study. And this is just uh, giving you uh, the, the cumulative events. You can see there the curves did separate, uh, but again, didn't meet statistical significance, 0 0.0587. This was CV death and total of first and recurrent heart failure hospitalizations. But you know, that's not the end of the story. What, what was very interesting is if you looked at the secondary or subgroup analysis, which was pre-specified, if you looked at males versus females, the two circled uh, boxes there at the bottom, there was a dramatic benefit in women, whereas we didn't see much of a difference in the, in the men. And as I mentioned to you earlier, HEF-PEF is a much more prevalent disease in women. Now, also at the very bottom there, they took the two groups and actually stratified by the median ejection fraction. So if you looked at an ejection fraction of greater than 57%, there really didn't look to be a difference. But in the population, the half um, that were 57% or less, again, a 22% reduction there in the secondary endpoint, suggesting Secubitril valsartan was better. Very interesting data. So it looked like there's, again, when we talk about phenotypes, uh, and this is, again, probably why so many of the prior studies with HEFPEF have really not shown any benefit. We have to think about who is the population who's going to benefit the most. So because of this, um, the FDA has actually updated Secubitril valsartan's label based on these sub-analyses. You know, up until now, realized that there had been no therapy that had shown any benefit in terms of mortality and morbidity. And now you have this sub-analysis that, you know, and a primary analysis that came very close. So this is the actual label now that Secubitril valsartan is indicated to reduce the risk of CV death and hospitalization for heart failure in adult patients with chronic heart failure. Benefits are most clearly evident in patients with left ventricular ejection fraction below normal, right? And it says LVEF is a variable measure, so use clinical judgment in deciding whom to treat. So they really left it up to the clinician to be able to make the decision about what a normal ejection fraction is and who would benefit. Now, based on the subgroup analysis that you saw there, 57% uh, or lower, that benefit was seen. And there was several sub-analyses that were done uh, and some other interesting studies that basically showed that 60% was a reasonable cutoff. So above 60% does not look like there's a lot of benefit. Below 60% uh, looks like where most of the benefit uh, is occurring. Again, this is a disease that has a very high morbidity and mortality, and we had no other therapy that has shown any benefit. Uh, now, there is an ongoing study called the Paraglide HF study, which is looking at the inpatient initiation of Secubitril valsartan for HEFPEF. We know that there was a pioneer study which showed that um, Secubitril valsartan was safe and effective uh, in the inpatient setting for HEF-REF. So 
suffice it to say, this looks like Secubitril Valsartan, um, you know, in our field really was a game changer in the sense that we had no other therapy for these patients. And remember, many of these patients are hypertensive. And we know that Secubitril Valsartan not only has naturesis, but is an excellent blood pressure lowering medication. So it turns out it likely works very well in this population. What about what else? SGLT2 inhibitors, sodium glucose uh, transporter uh, inhibitors. What a fascinating story, right? So initially started out as uh, anti-hyperglycemic agents. So basically allowing patients to pee out sugar for lowering A1C. And because the FDA had required studies to really look at CV outcomes, um, there were some studies that showed some potential benefit um, of these agents, both in terms of reducing uh, hard cardiovascular endpoints. But there was also some signal that it looked like it there might be some benefit with heart failure. Now, how do SGLT2s work? Lots of theories, lots of mechanisms, uh, but impacting cardiac cell metabolism, insulin sensitivity, microvascular dysfunction, systemic and myocardial inflammation, um, myocardial fibrosis, naturesis, blood pressure and arterial stiffness. If you, you know, those are some themes that we've been talking about throughout the course of this, this presentation, right? These are all mechanisms that play a large role in HFBAF. So there was a lot of uh, enthusiasm to try to study this. Um, the drug has already, these drugs have already been approved for HEF-REF um, and, and showed mortality and morbidity benefit. But what about in HEF-PEF? So this was the Emperor Preserve study, which was just published in the New England Journal in August of this past year. And what was the question? So in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, does empagliflozin improve outcomes? Um, and in the bottom left, you can see 18 and older, functional class two to four. Here, the ejection fraction was greater than 40%. They had to have an NT pro BNP that was elevated, a little bit higher if they were in AFib. They actually had to have structural, I meant you heard me say this earlier, left atrial enlargement or left ventricular hypertrophy, hallmarks, echocardiographic hallmarks of HEFPAP, be on stable diuretics and have a BMI of less than 45. About 6,000 patients were, received um, empagliflozin 10 milligrams versus placebo. And these were in diabetics as well as non-diabetics because the Emperor Reduce study for, um, showed that the benefit was seen with uh, this agent in both diabetics and non-diabetics. So similar was uh, similarly, this was done here. And you can see the primary outcome there, CV death or heart failure hospitalization, 13.8% with um, empagliflozin, 17.1% in the placebo group. That was a 21% relative risk reduction. And you can see the p-value there, less than 0.001. That is the first study ever to show a primary outcome benefit with any agent in HEFPAF that actually met statistical significance. And this was driven not by CV death, it was driven predominantly by heart failure hospitalization. Uh, and they did an interesting, a key secondary endpoint was the rate of decline in, in EGFR. We also know that these agents have some significant renal protective effects, which again is an issue when you talk about your HEFPAF population with a lot of chronic kidney disease. So really uh, a game changer. Now, this drug is in front of the FDA. It is not approved yet for HEFPAF, but it is now fast-track designation and being reviewed by the FDA currently uh, for this indication. And this is just showing you specifically um, the two event curves here. Uh, but importantly, look at what happens that at day 18 on the far left there, the curves separate within three weeks in terms of outcomes for these patients, in terms of heart failure hospitalization and CV death. This tells you, and this really drives home the point that you know when a patient has been hospitalized and it's that seminal event, early initiation, either in the hospital or potentially shortly once they get out of the hospital, can impact the trajectory for the patient. So really, really uh, powerful data. Now, this is a summary of um, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. This was um, the TopCat trial, which is a little bit older. This came out in 2014. And this was about 3,000 patients with HEFPEF who were randomized as spironolactone or placebo and looked at outcomes. And unfortunately, at the time, uh, 
uh, you know, it was a negative study. The, uh, the primary endpoint was not statistically significantly different between these two groups, uh, which was quite surprising because, again, a lot of the mechanistic action, spironolactone has impacts on fibrosis, it has impacts on naturesis, it has impacts on uh, blood pressure. So there was a real hope that this agent was going to be a game changer for HEFTA. But again, that study, uh, the primary uh, data as reported out, did not show significance. So why do I bring it up? Very interestingly, um, there was a lot of uh, debate about this study, and the heart failure community knows this well, because when you look at the specific populations, um, what was very interesting what showed up, there were two countries, Russia and Georgia, that enrolled a large number of patients in the study. And what you can see there at the top were the primary outcomes that the Russian and Georgian outcomes were like essentially there were no events in the Russian and Georgian population. And when you look at cardiovascular death, when you look at heart failure hospitalization, it was very unusual that, that those, those individuals were not getting admitted to the hospital. Something was, was fishy here. And interestingly, when they did sub-analyses and they actually measured uh, a, a metabolite of spironolactone, they found that there was hardly any metabolite in those in that population in the patients who were in Russia and Georgia. So they weren't getting the drug, number one. Uh, there was, so there was a lot of issues with this. Um, and when you actually look at and break it down by, you know, the vast majority of patients in the study that were recruited in the Americas, there was a highly statistically significant benefit to spironolactone compared to placebo. Now, you know, one, a true trialist would look at this and say, hey, you're cherry picking. But again, remember when this came out in 2014, there were no therapies that had any benefit in HEFPA. And so there was a real desire, again, mechanistically uh, for this agent. So because of this and because of these sub-analyses, um, you know, the community is really quite, um, the heart failure community is quite uh, aggressive about using spironolactone in the HEFPA population. Now, we still need more data, and the SPIRIT trial is a current trial looking at spironolactone in the HEFPEF population, um, mostly here at U.S. sites. Uh, Franciscan is actually uh, enrolling in this study, um, looking at um, to try to really get to, to the bottom of this uh, overall. So those are the three main therapies I wanted to focus on for HEFPEF. Now, one other really interesting aspect is um, iron deficiency. So it turns out that iron deficiency, so what are we talking about? A serum ferritin less than 100 uh, or a serum ferritin that's relatively low with a transferrin saturation less than 20%, those patients have mitochondrial dysfunction, they have oxidative stress, there's cellular apoptosis and reduced myocardial efficiency. And we know that those things lead to reduction in quality of life, reduced exercise capacity, impacts on cognition, impacts on hospitalization and mortality. Now, many of these same factors are seen in HEFPAF. So the question was, what about in HEFPAF, where there is a fair amount of iron deficiency and anemia? So this is a study called the AFFIRM AHF study that looked at hospitalizations for acute heart failure. If a patient was admitted, they had an ejection fraction less than 50%. So this included reduced EF as well as HEFPAF. And if they had a low ferritin, they were randomized to receive IV uh, iron, uh, three different, um, four different doses, one at the time of discharge, and then one at six weeks, 12 weeks, and 24 weeks, and, and compared to placebo uh, infusions, and to look and see what the outcome was. And this was the summary of the data. At 52 weeks, there was a lower prevalence of total heart failure hospitalizations and CV death among patients who received ferret carboxymaltose. Uh, and you can see a 21% relative risk reduction. Um, so, and this was published in the Lancet in 2020. So this was a meta-analysis of seven trials, which included that trial that I just mentioned to you. And you can see there that there was a, um, a significant benefit in terms of the odds uh, ratio here for heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular mortality. And again, driven predominantly by heart failure hospitalization. So multiple studies all when you put it together, they're um, a 27% reduction um, with IV iron. So because of that, the 2021 ESC guidelines has actually recommended for all heart failure patients should be periodically screened for iron deficiency anemia 
ferric carboxymaltose should be considered in symptomatic ambulatory heart failure patients with iron deficiency anemia and an ejection fraction less than 45% or hospitalized heart failure patients with an ejection fraction less than 50%. So another uh, you know, feather in our cap for these patients. Now, what about future studies? And we'll wrap it up here pretty soon. Fascinating uh, work being done in terms of atrial shunts. Um, remember, HEFPEF is a big issue is left-sided elevations and filling pressures, particularly left atrial pressure. So these shunts actually sense in real time high pressures in the left atrium and shunt a small amount of blood to the right atrium to decompress the left atrium. Multiple studies, multiple devices, a very active area of interest. The bottom right, you can see there what happens with uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure there uh, at rest. And then with exercise, both of these, when you put these shunts in, can reduce almost back to um, normal levels in patients who are even exercising. So another great concept for HEFPEP. So let's summarize some general HEFPEP tips. Uh, lower sodium diet, particularly in patients who are on loop diuretics to maintain euvolemia. Uh, many of these patients are obese and have untreated sleep apnea. So consider stop bang scores and getting them treated for sleep apnea. Uh, exercise, weight loss and exercise. You know, this is, a, this is a syndrome that affects exercise capacity. And one of the best ways to do that is exercise training, either through cardiac rehab or joining a gym. We wanna be very aggressive about blood pressure lowering in this population. Afterload really impacts filling pressure. So we wanna target a blood pressure of less than 130 over 80. And for those who are obese with a BMI greater than 35, consider bariatric referral if they haven't had uh, any success with dieting. So what are the take-home points? HEFPEP is a heterogeneous systemic syndrome. Remember that while BNP is useful in ruling out in and out HEFPEP, it can be falsely low in about 20% of obese patients. So you need to think about other factors like echocardiography, which is the cornerstone, assessing left ventricular ejection fraction. Look for structural abnormalities on the reports, left atrial size. Question the diagnosis if the left atrium is not enlarged. Look for left ventricular hypertrophy pulmonary hypertension, and the diastolic function measures that I mentioned to you, grade two or grade three. When in doubt, perform right heart catheterization. Make sure to perturb the system, either passive leg raise, exercise, or IV fluids. Remember, 30% of HEFPEF patients can have a normal wedge at rest. If the patient's volume overloaded, treat that with loop diuretics, assess their comorbidities, focus on weight loss and exercise. And then lastly, finally, 2022, Consider an ARNI as in the label, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, and hopefully soon we'll have an SGLT2, which again is, is under review by the FDA based on the Emperor Preserve data. So with that, I just want to thank, uh, it takes a village to take care of heart failure patients. Here are some of the folks at Franciscan who just, you know, I'm privileged to work with on a day in and day out basis. And there's some different task force that we're involved with to try to uh, tackle obesity, geriatrics, uh, and uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions you all have. And thank you so much for your time. Hey, VJ, this is Joe LaRosa with the ACO. Don't have any questions for you, but man, that was a home run presentation. Thanks for all your preparation you did for it. I, I learned a lot. I felt like I went through a cardiology fellowship. It was just Absolutely fantastic. I wanted to thank you. No questions because uh, you're way above me in the knowledge in the knowledge world, but I thought it was a great, great show. Thank, thank you so much, Joe. Um, I, you know, I'm just so thankful of, of the Franciscan team. Uh, you know, really, as I point out on this slide, there are so many individuals from that, that you know, are working together hand in hand to make this happen. And, uh, you know, I just, I'm privileged to be part of this, uh, this organization and to work with all of you. And, uh, it's an exciting, it's an important topic. I, I hope that, you know, you're able to glean some, uh, some, some clinical pearls here. And, um, you know, there, there are places around the country that have established HEF-PEF clinics specifically. Uh, there's a lot of clinical trial areas here. You know, I, in fact, I was just talking to Dr. Shea before this talk, who's one of our structural uh, imagers about some of these left atrial devices that could really be helpful for this population. And, thinking about trying to bring some of that to Franciscan as well. So, uh, but, but thank you for that comment. Don't forget to take yourself off of mute.
if you're asking a question. There you go. Thank you. Hey, that that was fantastic. It really was. But any any thoughts on using echocardiography for diastolic tr stress testing actually after you exercise them? Watching the uh, differential flow, do you think there's any utility in that? It, you know, in addition to the thoughts of right heart cath with exercise. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, the, the wise and brilliant uh, Tony Bashel, who uh, from <laughs> IHP. Um, no, absolutely. There, you know, exercise. You know, provoking the system is critical, right, for a half fat patient. The symptoms are exertional. So, you know, I mentioned the right heart cath piece. Certainly, that that's important when you're, you know, trying to make the definitive diagnosis. But absolutely, uh, stress echo has been used um, to to perturb the system. So multiple things can be looked at. To your point, one is pulmonary pressures with exercise. What happens in that setting? Uh, diastolic parameters that we mentioned, the, the E and A and all of that, that, that can be used to assess filling pressures has been done. The other really interesting piece is strain. So it turns out that, um, you know, another aspect of echocardiography that gets impacted by, by stiffness and by, by high filling pressures is strain levels. So multiple, you know, studies have been published on that. Patricia Pelica at Mayo is probably the one who's done most of the work on this. But um, but absolutely uh, can be helpful. I guess the question is what you know for making the several things. One is making the diagnosis right. If if things at rest look pretty good, but you're still kind of unsure, perturbing the system with exercise could potentially be one way to do this. But I think you know like anything, you have to kind of do it in a multi-pronged uh, format, like looking at it with natriuretic peptides, um, and and you know some of the pulmonary pressures and and other things, but. But I think I think stress echo is definitely um, a modality that can be helpful. And, and a second quick question: I always struggle with the concept that we were often taught beta blockers to promote filling, but in actual fact, beta blockers may be counterproductive due to the chronotropic that that you presented, and, and kind of sit there and go, well, where exactly do we go with beta blockading these people? I, I struggle with that one. Yeah, another another great point, Tony. So this is really interesting. You're right; we were sort of taught. The whole concept of you know tachycardia impacts filling, and we want to slow things down, give more time for filling. But what's interesting is that there's been several recent publications that looked at beta blocker use in the HEFPEF population, and the chronotropic response is one of the hallmarks of why somebody gets so fatigued and short of breath with exercise. And there's and they actually showed that coming off of beta blockers, you know, if you're just using it for hypertension. That patients have better exercise capacity, you know, and we know that, right? And you, you put a young person on a beta blocker, right? Their heart rate wants to go to 160, 170 when they're exercising, and they, it goes to 130, right? And they just can't exercise the way they normally would. And, and it's exactly what happens in the HEFPEF population. So it's a great point. There's, I think we will probably see in guidelines because of some of the recent studies that have been done that outside of AFib, now if somebody is in AFib, beta blocker use is absolutely indicated to control heart rate. But in a, if you're just using it for hypertension, there's a big push to move away, use ACEs, ARBs, ARNIs, and stay away from beta blockers. It's, a, yeah. it's an absolutely essential point. And I think more data is going to kind of show that over the next you know year or two. Okay. But that was great. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks. Well, we're, we're right at our time, and um, if anyone else has any other questions, uh, you could type them in the chat, and we'll still be able to access those, and we can get those questions to Dr. Rao, and he can uh, we can get the response to you. But um, thank you very much, Dr. Rao, for your presentation, and um, I just want to remind everyone to click the link in the chat to do the evaluation for this talk. And uh, the presentation is in the chat box if anyone needs to see a copy of it. Um, also wanted to remind the group on this call that we have, we're planning on doing these cardiovascular grand rounds monthly in 2022. So our next one will be coming up on March the 10th with Dr. George Lole, and he will be talking about cardiovascular testing updates. So um, watch for future presentations. But thank you so much, Dr. Rao. We really appreciate the education that you provided today. My pleasure. Thanks so much for your time. Take care, everyone. Great job.
Don, are there any other questions that you see in the in the chat box, or are we? Uh, oh, is this a wrap? Uh, there are no questions in the chat box. It. Let me make sure. It that there's no questions, so it it's a wrap. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Good night.